So in this video we're going to discuss some of the terminologies that are important in molecular orbital theory and then we're going to apply some of these terminologies to examples using what we refer to as homonuclear diatomic molecules. You're going to have two atoms in the molecule and then it's going to be homonuclear which just means that it's the same nuclei and the molecules we're going to talk about in this video would just be from the first period. So you're going to see examples using H2, uh, HE2, H2+, and so on. So these are all the type of molecules or molecular ions that we can discuss using the MO theory. Okay, so the first thing we should discuss is how we create molecular orbitals for a particular molecule. How do you make these orbitals, okay? And how do you use them to calculate energies? The first thing is to realize that the Molecular orbitals are created using a mathematical step called linear combination, which we discuss also for formation of hybrid orbitals. Okay, so you're going to do linear combination. But the difference between the hybrid orbital formation and the molecular orbital formation is that for molecular orbital, you're going to do linear combination of all the atomic orbitals that you have in the molecule. Okay, so when we did CH4, for example, okay, in the valence bond model, you would just say that only the carbon has hybrid orbital, and the hybrid orbital here is sp3. And the way you form those sp3 orbitals is to do a linear combination of the 1s and the 3p orbitals in carbon to form these sp3 orbitals. Okay, so there are four of them, and then they overlap with the 1s orbital from each of these hydrogen atoms. Okay, so that would have been in the valence bond model. In the molecular orbital model, what you'll do is you'll do linear combination, but you're going to do linear combination of all of the orbitals. So in other words, you use all the carbon orbitals plus all the H orbitals, and you do a linear combination with these orbitals, and what you'll get is a molecule that now has all the atomic orbitals combined to form these molecular orbitals, and then we can then use that set of molecular orbitals to predict the properties of CH4. That's the difference, okay? With valence bond, you only use some uh, atomic orbitals for the one atom to make your hybrid orbitals, whereas for molecular orbital, you use all the atomic orbitals from all the atoms in the molecule. Okay, so even though it might be difficult to understand linear combination and you're not expected to know how to do this mathematically, there's a simpler analogy that we can use to explain how molecular orbitals are created and that's using this concept of adding waves okay you have to remember that orbitals are modeled as standing waves so the function that represents an orbital is called a wave function so if you want to take one orbital and you want to add it to the other one it's similar to the process of adding waves and you remember when you try to add waves this process is called interference and you can have two types of interference you can have constructive interference or you can have destructive interference and we talk about this in the quantum chapter as well okay so what we would do here is to use these two ideas of constructive and destructive interference to try to show how you can get a specific type of molecular orbital as a result of adding these waves from the atomic orbitals before we actually talk about the type of molecular orbitals that are formed it's a good reminder to tell you what the meaning of constructive and destructive interference is. Remember that constructive interference just means that you add two waves and the waves are in phase. It's the picture here on the left, if I have two waves A and B, and so their phases are aligned like this, that means that when I add them together, I'm going to get a wave that's twice the amplitude in the positive direction as well as twice the amplitude in the negative direction. Okay, so remember you can have two types of amplitude, you can have a positive, you can have a negative amplitude here. However, if you're destructive interference, you're still adding waves. However, in this case, the waves are out of phase in this situation. So when you add to two of them together, you have a decrease in amplitude. So you, this might go completely to zero. It might go very small, for example, maybe something like that as the resulting wave. And again, you can still have positive and negative, right? Positive and negative right here. Uh, it's just a lot uh, smaller amplitude than what you have originally. Now, the specific terminology for MO theory is that if you have a constructive interference when you're adding the two waves that represent the atomic orbitals, then 
the type of MO that you're going to form, the molecular orbital that you're going to form is called a bonding molecular orbital. If you have a destructive interference, then that molecular orbital is going to be called anti-bonding. And you'll see in a second how we actually label these guys in terms of symbols, okay? So if we use H2 as an example of this, remember that in H2, the atomic orbitals that you have in the molecule is basically the two 1s orbitals that each hydrogen atom brings in, right? So what kind of molecular orbitals can be formed when you only have two 1s orbitals? Well, there's two types of interference, again, as we just talked about, constructive interference of the two 1s orbitals will give you a bonding molecular orbital, and that bonding molecular orbital will be called a sigma 1s molecular orbital. Okay, so in other words, this sigma 1s, is a, it's a new type of orbital, and that's a molecular orbital. It's not your atomic orbital anymore. If you have a destructive interference of the two 1s orbitals, then you're going to get an anti-bonding molecular orbital, which will be called sigma 1s star. So the only difference between these two symbols is that one of them has a star, and the star always indicates the anti-bonding, okay? They're both called sigma 1s, and we'll talk about the meaning of the sigma designation later on, as far as what that type of molecular orbital is, but right now we just want to know what they're called, okay? So one, the bonding is called sigma 1s, and the other anti-bonding is called sigma 1s star. So how does this look like with the H2 molecule? You can see in this drawing right here, okay? So let's imagine that the wave function that represents the 1s orbital is shown right here. So here's psi, right? You can see the symbol right here. So that's the psi for 1s. And then this is the psi of the other 1s from the second hydrogen atom. And what you're doing is you're just taking the two of them and you're doing a linear combination. But remember, this is similar to adding waves. So I would take the wave that corresponds to 1s and just add the two of them together. If I were to do that for these two waves, so this is one of the waves, this is the second wave, if I were to do that, the shape I would get as a result of adding the two waves is this shape right here, okay? So that's the result of the constructive interference. These dots here represent the nuclei of the two hydrogen atoms, okay? Now this is the psi that's the result of the adding of the two atomic orbitals, okay? So this is now your molecular orbital, and it's called sigma 1s. But remember that psi alone doesn't have a physical meaning. You only have a meaning in psi when you square the wave function. And when you square it, it represents probability. So then what you do is you take this function, you know, you just square that wave function. And so then you get psi square here. And the shape changes just slightly and looks like this, okay? So this is, again, the original shape looks like that. Once you square it, it looks like this. So that's sigma 1s, okay? Now, the other step, of course, is to do the destructive interference, which is, again, just adding them. But now they have different phases. They're out of phase with respect to each other. So when you add these two waves, which are out of phase with respect to each other, in other words, one of them is a positive phase, the other one is a negative phase, then what you get is the following shape. This represents the sigma 1s star, which is the, the psi that's uh, a result of adding these two waves in a destructive interference from opposite phases. The psi alone doesn't have any meaning. You have to square it. So when you square it, the, uh, the negative part becomes positive as well. So then you get a shape that looks like this, okay? Which, if you were to show it by drawing, would look like this, okay? So that's the sigma 1s star orbital in terms of probability density. So this is the, the shape that we get just uh, from talking about it in the previous slide. The two molecular orbitals that we get out of adding the 1s atomic orbitals, whether constructively or destructively, okay? One of them is what we call the bonding, which is the sigma 1s, and the other one is what we call the anti-bonding. Now, the two dots here represent the nuclei, okay? If you think about it, which of the following structure will be energetically more favorable? This shape here represents electron density, okay? So for the bonding molecular orbital, you have uh, quite a bit of electron density in between the two nuclei, right? You also have electron density here, you have electron density here, but a lot of it is just found in between the two nuclei. Whereas with the anti-bonding, your electron density is right here, most of it is right on the sides, and you actually have a node right here in between the two nuclei, okay? So what's that mean about energy? Remember that the energy that stabilizes 
the molecule is this electrostatic interaction, right? The interaction between a positive and a negative. The more you have this interaction, the more stable that particular system is going to be. If you look at these two structures of the molecular orbital, I can easily say that if I were to draw an energy diagram right here, then this one would be lower in energy compared to that one right there. Because in the bonding molecular orbital, in the sigma 1s, I have most of my electrons, again, found between the two nuclei. And that's great because then the two nuclei, which are positively charged, can stabilize that electron density or is stabilized by interacting with that electron density. Whereas here, I don't have that interaction. Right in the middle, I don't have any electron density. So as a result, this one would be less stable, so the energy would be higher. Okay, So you can then represent the two orbitals with this energy diagram where the sigma 1s is at the bottom and then the sigma 1s star is higher in energy. Okay, I want to emphasize that we're going to use this energy diagram representation quite a bit in molecular orbital and the energy diagram representation is really the same one that you've used before for atomic orbitals as well and we show that the atomic orbitals have different energies. The 1s is the most stable, and then the 2s is the next uh, stable, and then the 2p, and then the 3s, and so on. So we're going to do the same thing here for the molecular orbital, except that we don't no longer have our 1s, 2s, and whatnot. What we have are the series of molecular orbitals, which are shown right here. And then we're just going to rank the stability of these molecular orbitals from the lowest to the highest, just the same way as we did for atomic orbitals. So now we're going to have sigma 1s being the lower one and then sigma 1s star. And as we go through the second period element, we're going to come up with more molecular orbitals with different names corresponding to those coming from the second period atomic orbitals.